for their resentment. They will mistrust you and they won't want to cooperate with you. They, they will not like it if we do this regularly and we always win. Then, then there's the, we both lose. Let's just not talk about this. We will just avoid that area, never talk about it. We won't have a confrontation, but this can lead to cold isolation and resentment. The conflict doesn't get solved. We just pull apart every time we sense a conflict. There's something else that comes in between us we can't talk about. Then there's harmonizing. I, will, I lose so you can win just to keep the peace. Um, and this can sometimes lead to, as I say, being unbalanced, the person being silenced or overly submissive. Then there's the compromising, but you need to be aware of the other person's perception of balance because they might think that um, you've won more than them and you might think that they've won more than you. So it's, it's okay sometimes, but um, just make sure it's not competitive and it's, it's caring and, and trustworthy. And then there is this, this best one, which we should try and aim for, which is I win and you win. And when we can do this, this is the best because it tolerates diversity. There is listening, understanding, empathy. Let me understand what you want. I'll listen to what you want. And let's see how we can get both together. If you like this approach and want to learn more, Gary Chapman, who's written the five love, love languages, has written Everybody Wins, um, and it's a book about how to do this in more detail than I'll tell you today. So why should we be peacemakers? Well, the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called, what? Children of God. So peacemakers are called children of God because actually God is the greatest peacemaker in the universe. He's bringing us together with him forever, and, and this work of peace has taken a long time, um, but he's busy resolving this conflict, this, this great universal conflict of the ages, and he's working on it. And when we try to create peace in small ways in our human relationships with the people around us, we are children of God. We are also doing his work. His characteristics are seen in us. Um, I used to do some training with the Center, the Scottish Center for Conflict Resolution, which was run by the Cyrenians in Scotland. And uh, they have an amazing website, but I'll put at the end of this PowerPoint. But in Scotland, where there's 5 million people, when I started working for them, 5,000 young people a year became homeless because of family conflict. Can you imagine 5,000 young people left their home every year or at, at any point in time because of family conflict? Quite often a family had um, broken up and then reassembled and one of the parents was not the young person's parent and that could cause more issues and a more likelihood of conflict, but not always. Relationship breakdown has a massive economic effect because every time a family breaks up, they're find two houses where they had one, it puts pressure on the housing market, people are more alone, it affects people's mental health, it affects the children in the relationship. So relationship breakdown is, is huge, it has a devastating effect. And we need to be aware that when we are peacemakers, we're helping to bring God's love and peace into those relationships. Underneath most challenging conflicts, there are deep issues we need to face ourselves. What Christ-like fruit of the spirit characteristics am I striving for? So, you know, how, where am I on the pride humility scale? Because the more pride I have, the more likely I want to win the argument and I will hurt other people. If I'm extremely, extremely humble, then I will let other people win and maybe treat me like a doormat. I have to have a balance on here. Then there's the selfishness. The more selfish I am, the more I will want to win and have it my way. We've seen some people in um, leadership in the world that have this, this trait and you see how the conflicts escalate around them because of their selfishness. Then there's how critical we are of others. That will lead to more conflict and the more accepting and kind we are to others, then that will reduce our conflict. And what is our need to control? Do I have to have everything my way? Do I need to control everything? Or am I able to collaborate and compromise with other people to find peace? 
which is what we often need to do, let go of ourselves and find some peace. Okay, now this is the funny time in this because my husband isn't here with me. And normally right now we have an argument. We have like the worst kind of argument we could imagine. And I want you to think, um, and unfortunately it's not so easy to dialogue about this, but normally I would get you to think about what are we doing wrong? We do lots of things wrong. So if you're, um, I've got someone near you in the room with you, talk to them and point out all the things that we are doing wrong. So the scenario is that I put some, um, a dish of potatoes on the table and we've been having potatoes every meal for quite a few days now and you'll find out why. And I put the potatoes on the table and this immediately starts an argument. So I put the potatoes on the table and I'll be Bernie and then I'll be Karen and hopefully you can work out who is who. Bernie says, not potatoes again. We've had them every meal for the past three days. Potato waffles, pancakes, potato soup, and now potato curry. I am fed up with potatoes. Can't you cook anything else? Of course I can. Don't be so stupid. You know we don't always eat potatoes. Just stop complaining and eat them up. But I'm fed up with all these potatoes. It's boring. Can't you make something else for a change? Well, don't blame me. You're the one who bought two huge sacks of potatoes for four pounds. <gasps> so it's all my fault, is it? All my fault that you are cooking potatoes for every meal. Yes, completely all your fault. So just eat them up and stop moaning. Why is everything bad always my fault and never your fault? Hmm, interesting question. Let me see. Well, you were the one who bought all those potatoes to save money, and now they are sprouting like crazy in the garage, and I'm trying to use them up before they stink. Well, eating potatoes at every meal stinks too. What crazy person would do that? I'm sick to death of them. Good, because I don't like cooking them. They're muddy and disgusting, and they're hard work. Scrubbing them, digging their eyes out, peeling them. I never want to see another potato for the rest of my life. But it's your fault I bought the potatoes in the first time. I was trying to economize because you bought a new dress. <gasps> a new dress? I paid six pounds for it in a charity shop and you're blaming me for overspending. You've always been mean with your money. I'm tired of savoring every penny. It's probably your mum's fault. She still thinks she's living in the Second World War. And so do you. She brought you up to be so careful with money that we are miserable all the time. Well, I have to be careful with money because you spend so much. If I didn't try to economize on a few things, we would be bankrupt and starving and homeless and it would be all your fault. Well, if we're ever starving and homeless, you'll be all right. You can go back home to your German mother and she will take care of you. And I bet she will never serve you potatoes. Eat your own potatoes, I'm going to McDonald's. Bang, the door slams. <sighs> I bet he has a large fries. So there was a big argument, a big messy argument, and I did lots of things, we did lots of things wrong there. I'm sure if you were um, listening, you'd see that we escalate. We take something very small like potatoes, that is just a very simple everyday thing. And we make it like World War Three, and we slam doors and we, we have a major, major row. We also blame the other person. It's all your fault. It's not my fault, it's all your fault. And whenever we blame the other person, we automatically push ourselves away from each other. Um, and then there's um, blaming the family, getting historical about things, digging things up from the past, moving into other issues like finances. There are so many things that we are doing wrong there in that situation. We're not listening to each other. So because we are blaming, escalating, using things from the past, taking a small thing and making it big, we are making a big problem. Something we need to understand um, that the, under most conflicts, there is a big question. There are big questions. And they're not the questions that we think they are. Someone who did a lot of research into couples who argued found that underneath their conflicts, they were not arguing about potatoes and money. They were really saying, do you love me? Do you care about me? 
Are you able to understand what I am feeling right now? Can you empathize with me? Are you willing and able to help me when I'm struggling? And will you always be there for me? Can I depend on you? You know, actually, um, God answers all these questions in our life. We know he's always there to love us. We know he understands what we're feeling and cares for us. We know he wants to help us when we're struggling. We know we can depend on him. But in our human relationships, these are big questions of security that um, if, when they're not answered, they fuel the conflict. The interesting thing is when we live in ways that keep these questions constantly answered positively, we are much less likely to have conflict. So if every day we are being kind to people around us, if we tell them as often as we can that we love them, if we try and understand their feelings and tell them, oh, that sounds, that sounds really sad, when they talk to us and we show we understand and feed the feelings back to them, they feel understood. When we help each other in the home, then there are less arguments. And the more helpful, helpful we are to each other, then there is less resentment that can fuel arguments. And also when we make sure that we're committed to each other and we express that commitment and we don't threaten to leave and walk out the door and go to McDonald's, then we, we feel more safe. And when those big questions are answered in our everyday lives, the amount of conflict often will come down. We need to be aware of that. That's why caring is so important. So this morning I talked a couple of times about being kind and loving and try to do at least one kind thing for the people in your house every day, even if you don't feel like it, because it can really help to improve the, the atmosphere in the home or in any relationship at work, wherever you are, doing something kind. Because when I see you as a kind person doing kind things for me, if you do something that I think, whoa, that's a bit strange or it's not perfect, you know, I will think they care for me. This is just one day. I can let it go. Um, so we need to the, um, be as caring as we can to reduce the conflicts so we're less likely to have them. I sometimes ask families to do secret kindnesses for each other and see if they can spot when the other person is being kind to them. Can they notice? So they start looking for kindness instead of for hurt, and that changes their perspective. <clears throat> so, so being understanding and empathic, be aware of the other person's emotions. These are two of my grandchildren, by the way. Um, be aware of the other person's emotions, listen to their feelings and show understanding and compassion. Be sad when they're sad and happy when they're happy. So that comforting that we talked about in the sermon is also a way to help improve relationships. When we show we care about their feelings, um, then we're less likely to argue. Actually, the more often we appreciate each other in a relationship, the less likely we are to argue as well, because again, that reduces resentment. If you appreciate what I'm doing for you, if you appreciate my cooking, if you appreciate the potatoes and the effort rather than your board, then we would not have had the argument that we had earlier that I displayed to you. So look for creative ways to appreciate each other and be as thankful as you can, because that is um, researchers found, found that saying thank you to each other will reduce the conflicts. Also, when we say thank you to each other, we don't just make the other person feel good, we will usually feel happier ourselves. So God wants us to be grateful because it blesses us as well as the other person. Be helpful. So um, bear one another's burdens. Ask what you can do to be helpful today. Know what the other person hates doing and do them together. Say, I've got half an hour to spare and I'd like to help you. What can I do? I heard about a man who saved his marriage from breaking down when he decided to give his wife half an hour of help every single day. And eventually it softened her heart and they were able to grow their relationship back again because of that extra support and help. So these are all things that we can do naturally that will um, help to protect our relationship from more conflict when we do these caring things for each other. Helps to keep the relationship mended with gold constantly. So insecurity is what often fuels conflicts. So don't threaten to, to leave, 
Um, keep telling people that you love them very much. You, you never want to leave them. They're very special to you. Those sorts of committed um, expressions in marriage can be very helpful. And also with our children, you know, don't threaten to leave and abandon them. That's very scary for them. So we avoid doing things that make the other person feel afraid because perfect love casts out fear, says John in his uh, little epistle. Then pick your battles. Like, is this really worth arguing about? Because many times it isn't. And happy couples tend to focus, um, they try to also solve the small problems, which gives them a sense they can work things out together. So most battles aren't worth it. And then if you're actually solving your small issues well, then you feel like you can manage the big things. You feel connected. You, and also you learn the skills to manage your conflicts better when you practice on small issues that are easily resolvable rather than a big thing which may not be resolvable because not every conflict is. So is this issue really more important than our relationship? Is eating potatoes and making an issue about the dinner more important than our marriage? No. Um, so choose a time when you're both relaxed. Take the time to think about the best way to approach the topic. If it's a big issue, give the other person time to think about the issue before you discuss it together. And if you, if someone comes up with something that they want you to deal with with them and you haven't had time to think about it, you can say something like, I can see this is a really important issue for you. I would like to give it some serious thought. So is it okay with you if we discuss this tomorrow evening because I really want to take some time to think about it so that I can give you the best answer. And that can sometimes help us not to be sort of hijacked into a conflict suddenly when we're not ready and we haven't had time to think and work things through. Also, it's good to share the problem. So when we use words like, we have a problem, this is our problem, I wonder what we can do to solve it, then, um, then things will usually go better rather than if I blame the other person. So in the example of the potato argument, one of us could have said, you know, we've got a problem. Neither of us like eating this many potatoes. So why don't we do something else? Um, you know, get Uber Eats or find something else in the freezer and uh, let that problem go. <clears throat> a gentle answer turns away wrath and that's a biblical principle. You know, when we lower our voice, then it makes things um, much more peaceful. So, in the potato argument that I had with myself, because my husband's not here, my voice got louder and louder and louder. But if I had said, if I had spoken more and more quietly, um, it, it probably would have um, dissolved the argument. Because if I had said, um, spoken calmly, then it would not have aroused um, the anger and irritation in the other person, which is often what happens. It calms the other person down. So lower your voice instead of raising it and whisper. Sometimes I would do this with my children. I'd sneak up to them and whisper what I wanted rather than yell at them. And they would like listen in and they'd want to do it more because I whispered than if I'd, I'd shouted. And, and do have your conflicts in the same room. Um, I have heard of couples who have their conflicts and she's in the kitchen and he's in the living room and they have to shout at each other. And they can't see each other and then things get worse and worse. So try and have your conflicts in the same room, face to face, try and speak more calmly and respectfully. And start by acknowledging the other person's feeling and wishes. So Bernie started to complain about the potatoes as he did in this argument that we had. I could say, you know, darling, I can see you're really fed up with eating potatoes, aren't you? It's really bothering you. And that's understandable. Now, if I had started by saying that, um, to my husband, to my teenager, to whoever else, I can understand why this is bother. I, you know, I get that. Um, then that can be a way of changing how you start off the argument because the other person feels like you already care about them and understand what they're feeling. Then another biblical principle is to listen. Lead with your ears, follow with your tongue and let anger straggle along in the rear, says James. Um, and King Solomon said this very profound thing, answering before listening is stupid and rude. And actually 
In the potato argument that Bernie and I, imaginary argument we had, we were both answering before listening. And that's what happens in lots of arguments. We want to answer, um, to gain points, to win against the other person, and we're not really listening. Many arguments can be helped by listening to the other person and saying what you heard. So when Bernie said, not potatoes again, we've had them every meal for the past three days, I would say something like, it sounds like you're really fed up with eating potatoes because we've had them so often in the last few days and you're really getting frustrated with that. Now, if I say that, if I listen well, sum up what they've said and say it back to them to show I've understood, Bernie's answer to that will be, yes, you're right, I am fed up with eating them. And it's naturally a calmer response when we have expressed what they've said and say, is that, is that what you said? And they all go, yeah, that's, that's what I mean. We, we suddenly calm down. And then if we listen to their viewpoint and reflect it back and then say, well, this is, this is my frustration is that I have all these potatoes in the garage and I don't want them to go to waste. So please help me think what to do with them. We'd have a very different conversation. So be respectful because whenever we start to be disrespectful, it makes things worse. In the argument that I had, this pretend argument, there was blaming, insulting, shouting, leaving, and slamming doors. All those things will make things worse. So treat each other as equals. Talk to your spouse as you would talk to your boss because they're even more important. If you can talk respectfully to your boss when you have a disagreement with him or when there's a conflict between you, you can use those same skills at home and treat your spouse as respectfully as you would your boss or other important person because they are even more important. Mm -hmm. Think about the other person, put yourself in their shoes, think what's important to them and why. Why does this thing happening now? Why is it so important to them? Why, why do they want this so much? And sometimes they might not know and we have to go back to their past experiences and think, you know, when have you felt like this before? When has this meant so much to you before? Um, and there might have been a trauma in the past or a fear or they may have been bullied or shamed and they might not realize that this leaves a hurt spot in their life. And you might not be teasing them or bullying them or shaming them, but they're hypersensitive to some kind of comment or criticism. And when you do that, it, it makes them go ouch inside and then they, they start to hurt and they feel uncared for, but you just didn't know that was a painful place for them. And actually some couples um, are now taught to tell each other, oh, ouch, you know, if, if, if he trod on my toe, I'd say, ouch, you just trod on my toe. And he would say, sorry. But we need to tell each other a little ouch in, in conversation sometime. You know, ouch, for some reason, what you just said hurt me. Let me think about why that was. Um, because often we will just yell and react um, and not actually talk about what was going on there. Why did that hurt so much? Now, this is a really useful thing to do that I teach um, most of my clients who come to me that have arguments. And um, rather than having a, um, a grumpy complaint, make a clear and polite request. So rather than going, I don't want to eat potatoes anymore. I hate eating them. You're so stupid for cooking them all the time. Can't you do anything else? You would say, in this situation, when this happens, I feel this because, and it would help me if you would do this and I could help you by doing this. So in this situation, when... We have, when I eat potatoes for several days in a row, I start to feel bored and frustrated because I like to have more variety in my food and it would really help me if we could eat something different, maybe even now, maybe we could get some takeaway. And then I could help you because I would, I would feel, I'd feel more happy, I suppose, if I was eating more variety. And then you invite their ideas. What ideas do you have that would help us to work this out? And this is a really helpful pattern when you really want to talk about something difficult and um, that's bothering you in a way that is very respectful, very controlled. It's a polite request rather than a complaint. And it will tend to be more accepted by the other person and they'll want to come in and help you. <clears throat> so 
I get people to write this down and you could take a photograph of the screen if you like and use this to help them formulate a polite request. A grumpy complaint will almost always get a grumpy answer and an escalated argument. A clear and polite request is more likely to get um, a positive response. <clears throat> so this is, this is the answer here. When we eat potatoes at every meal, I feel bored and frustrated be nice if we only ate potatoes once a day, and so on. <clears throat> Go for win-win solutions. This is really important, but you can both win. So neither of us wanted to eat, the, the, eat all those potatoes. So a good win-win is to say, like, um, just have them once a day. We'll order a takeaway. We'll get a pizza at the freezer. We'll go out for a meal and do something different. So it's more important to protect the relationship than to win the argument and to, to go for a win-win solution. Um, because whenever you win an argument, you lose closeness and trust in the relationship. You don't really win. Every time one person wins, the other person feels hurt. They feel more distant. They feel not as important. They feel they lose their trust in you and they don't feel cared for. And so winning actually loses some of the most important things that you want. So apologizing doesn't mean that you are right or wrong. It means you value your relationship more than your ego. And that's a mature Christian positive response. Now, this morning I told you in the sermon about a time when our 15 year old son stopped us at the dinner table <clears throat> because we were having an argument. <clears throat> And what happened was that Bernie and I are actually both trained family therapists. And we were training at about the time our children were teenagers. And we decided it, it would be really good to have some well-managed adult conflicts in front of our children so they could learn that adults have conflicts and they manage them in really positive and mature ways. This was the plan. We have no idea what we were arguing about that night at the table but it got out of hand, evidently, before we even realized. And the first thing we realized that it wasn't working was when our son, 15 year old son, banged on the table like this, bang, bang, bang. Mom, dad, stop, he said. You're arguing like children and you both should know better. Bernie and I were both like, whoa, what just happened there? Is our 15 year old son, a middle child of the three, was saying, stop arguing, he's the peacemaker. <clears throat> and he, he turned to Bernie and he said, dad, listen to mom with your heart, listen to her feelings and show you care. And I'm thinking, yay, go son. And then Nathan turns to me and he said, and mom, listen to dad with your brain because he has some really sensible things to say. And we're both like, right, okay. <laughs> we both got to learn from this. And you know, he was so right. We were arguing in two different languages and that never works. So I'm speaking emotional language and Bernie is speaking rational language and we're not connecting. We may as well be speaking Chinese and Russian because it's not the same language. And actually what you need to do is listen to the emotions first and calm them down because when um, I get emotional, my brain or anyone else's brain is firing off in the emotional part of the brain. And when that happens, it's very hard to engage with your rational part of your brain. So don't even try. If someone is angry or upset, don't try and be rational with them. You will just annoy them like crazy because they cannot deal with rational thinking when they're very emotional. We need to let the emotions calm down first. And it can take 40 minutes for the emotional part of the brain to calm down enough for the rational part to work well. So help someone to calm down, wait until they're calm, listen to the emotions, the feelings behind the conflict. And then um, when they are heard and understood, then you can start to have a more rational conversation. It's interesting because whenever Bernie and I do the potato argument that I, that I did earlier in the presentation, um, that gets me very aroused in my emotional part of the brain 
even though it's a fake argument and we know it's not real and it's not not in real life. Um, and so sometimes I think I'll say something really stupid in this rest of the presentation because I'm too much in my emotional brain and I won't calm down for another 20 minutes. So you'll have to bear with me if I say something stupid. Then we need to know how to soothe each other. <clears throat> so if someone is very emotional, know how to soothe each other during stressful times. Because many arguments happen because we're stressed. What calms the other person down? How can sense of humor help? How can you get more sleep? Because tiredness makes us more irritable and argumentative. So how can we help someone to calm down when they're feeling um, very stressed? And sometimes you can find a way to let them know you care. And just to say something like, you know, we're having this argument and it's, it's kind of strange, but you know, you need to know that I, I love you. I'm never gonna stop loving you and we'll get through this argument somehow, but you need to know that it doesn't change anything in the relationship. Now that's not always easy or appropriate to say, but some people try and in a, in a caring, kind way, reach out and, and care for the other person. And showing that care can bring you together instead of pushing you apart in the conflict. But everyone is different in how they relate to that. So then we make a list of possible ideas to solve the problem together. And each person rates each idea out of 10 to see which gets the highest score between you. And then choose one that has the highest score or the second highest score. Agree on it together. Try the idea for a week. It's important to see trying a new idea as an experiment. Let's do it for a week and see what happens. Then evaluate it, change it, adapt it, choose another idea. But if I'm going to try an idea for a week, then I'll go, okay, it's only for a week. I don't have to do it this way the rest of my life. Let's just see what happens. And it can help me to be a bit more flexible or the other person to be more flexible about some solutions. <clears throat> so well-managed conflicts can bring you closer together because the goal is to increase your understanding of each other, to look for unselfish ways to solve your problems that work for both of you. And then as you understand each other, to find ways to show more love and kindness and do less of the things that hurt the other person that you might not have realized hurt them. You weren't doing it intentionally, but we didn't understand some of the pain in the past or things that really bothered them a lot. And by talking about it, you can understand them and do less of them. But there are some conflicts that are unresolvable. So whereas in many cases you can find a win-win, there are some times when someone has to lose and the one who gains needs to be compassionate and understanding to the other person. So for example, if one of you is from one country, say someone's from England and someone is from Spain, then um, you can't live in England and Spain. You have to live in one country or the other. There's not a, a win-win solution to that. So it's unresolvable. One person will have to live in a country that might not be their country, that might not be their first choice to live in. And the person um, who, for whom it is a better choice needs to do everything they can to help their partner um, accept that situation, be comfortable in the situation, agree how many times they can go back to their country on holiday, do everything possible to make the unresolvable situation as best as it can be for the one who is losing out the most. <clears throat> Now, I've gone through lots of different ideas today of different tips that can uh, help reduce your conflicts. And I wonder, what are the three most useful tips that you are taking away today? I wonder what you and your partner or your children or whoever else you live with or work with, wonder what you argue about the most. Quite often, it's very small things. Some research has shown that the thing that most families and couples argue about the most is the washing up. Whether they have a dishwasher or whether they don't have a dishwasher, most of the arguments are about who didn't do the washing up, who didn't empty or fill the dishwasher, who didn't dry this or do it that way. And, and it's amazing how many arguments are about washing up. And we need to think, is that really worth it? You know, um, 
what am I doing to my relationship arguing about the washing up? How can we make that better? So quite often we argue about relatively small things. So I wonder what tips you have learned from me today that you think you would like to try in your own relationship? What new insights have you had that will help you when you realize you're going to encounter a conflict of some sort? What can you do differently? Because one person doing something differently can change everything. In the argument that Bernie and I had about the potatoes, almost any time anyone spoke, they could have said something different that would have lowered the um, tone of the argument, turned the argument into something more positive, added some humor, some different possibilities, and changed that whole situation. Many times when we argue, we fall into a pattern. And it's the same pattern we've gone through again and again and again. And when we start the argument, we know just where it's gonna end up. Um, but at any point in time, any one of you can do something different to reduce the argument, to show care, to show gratitude, to add some appropriate sense of humor, to listen well to the other person and say, oh, I can see that you're really fed up with eating potatoes. So let's think what we, using us, we, plural language, let's think what we can eat instead tonight. So that could have changed. Um, I could have said, um, you know, at any point in time, something else and not let it escalate as much as it did. And I was adding extra fuel to the fire by talking about his mother. He added fuel to the fire by talking about finances. And we both made it worse instead of both trying to make it better. So here are some useful resources for you. Um, so the scottishconflictresolution.org.uk was where I used to do some volunteering. If you go to their website and look for keep the heed, that's Scottish for stay calm, keep, keep your head. There's a really fun quiz online to find out your conflict style and what you can learn about it. What is um, maybe not helpful about it and what you can do differently to manage your conflicts better. It's quite good fun it's designed for teenagers so they become different circus characters in their conflict styles. And then if you're a couple, there is a really brilliant app. Um, Actually, that's a website, but it's now an app um, and it's just called Toucan Together, like Toucan the Bird Together. It's by some Christian friends of ours. It has um, one person gets the app and then invites the other person to join them. And it has free modules like, like marriage seminars that are brilliant on conflict, communication, love and sex, money, etc. It is really excellent. I could not have created a better app for couples ever. I could never have conceived of something as amazing as they have done. It has videos of couples and I've met these couples, they're all Christian. And eventually they're going to bring out a module about faith and relationships, but they wanted to try and encourage non-Christians to make use of this app to help their relationships before they get onto the, the spiritual modules but it's excellent, do do it. I've referred many couples to this and it has saved their marriages and it's free, fun, and um, bite-sized chunks of information on your phone that you can do. And then after a few, it says, now go and find your spouse and talk about what you've learned together. Um, and it's, it's excellent. There's even some ideas from Bernie and I on the conflict module because we, we talked to them about our ideas. So. Do get some help if you are having conflict. It's really important. Don't just let it fester and ruin your relationship. Your relationship is, is much more valuable than that. Um, and there are uh, resources to help you with your conflict, like Gary Chapman's book, um, Two Can Together, um, seminars online. There is the marriage course, which is a Christian course on marriage. There is loads of materials to help couples with conflict. It never has to be something that tears you apart. And quite often one or two sessions with a family or couple therapist, um, make sure they're especially trained in couples, can also help you to work through some conflicts and learn some skills. So I hope that this has given you 
some ideas about managing your conflicts, what you can do differently, and how you can have more peaceful relationships that uh, so we can all be peacemakers and, and blessed and children of God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you are the most amazing peacemaker in the universe and that you're working so hard to make peace with us, with, uh, with everything that is broken. Thank you that we can learn from you. We can learn from scriptures, these biblical principles of loving, caring, listening, putting other people first, being kind, um, soothing each other, different ways that we can help to manage our conflicts so they don't tear us apart. Help us to use them to understand each other more, to get to know more about how we can love each other better rather than to pull away and hurt each other. I pray you will change our hearts and inspire us to be peacemakers in every relationship so that they can experience more of your love through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Carol. And we will have now a break, a short break. Uh, we will resume four o'clock. Is that all right? So you can shake off a little bit, have some water, and maybe go to the toilet if you need. And we will be back four o'clock then to finish with our last presentation. It is a very interesting presentation about emotions and how to deal with our emotional life, especially in the times we are now. So I'll see you in a minute, okay? Enjoy a break.
Colchester. Colchester Children's Choir. Please come up front. Let's encourage them with a big amen. Oh, you want to clap hands? Hello, welcome back. Um, it's four o'clock now. Um, I'm guessing it's time for me to start the next workshop. Is that so? Yes, please, Karen. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's kind of difficult when you're looking into nothing but an empty living room and a, and a screen to know what's going on behind. So um, hopefully you can see my screen and you can hear me. And we're going to talk about how to be healthy and happy because as we know today, our, our health and our happiness are actually very interlinked. It's not just about what we eat and exercise, but actually our emotions are a very important part of our happiness and our health. <clears throat> so I want you to think for a moment um, about Zacchaeus. Imagine him up the tree in Luke 19. And what is feeling up in that tree? He's feeling lonely rejected, guilty, sad, all sorts of what we would call negative emotions. But then Jesus comes, Jesus connects with him, Jesus smiles at him, Jesus welcomes him, Jesus does not criticize him, Jesus accepts him. And Jesus says, you know what? I wanna to come to your house for dinner. And Zacchaeus goes from all those negative feelings that drain him to all, loads of positive feelings that lift him up. So this afternoon, when I'm talking about negative feelings and positive feelings, they're not bad and good. Feelings just are. They're just information in our body about what's happening inside us and around us. Um, negative emotions are those that drain the energy out of us and pull us down. And positive emotions are those that energize us and lift us up. So when I talk about negative and positive emotions, 
bear that in mind. So I'm also going to talk about emotional balance. So balance is important in our emotions because if we get too many negative emotions, um, they will drag us down. We will get um, exhausted, maybe depressed, maybe burnt out if we don't manage them well. And when we get balance um, between our negative and positive emotions, it can help us to stay buoyant and resilient. So it's really important that we understand this balance and how to help ourselves have the balance and how to nurture positive emotions in our children and those around us. So we used to think in the olden days that healthy and happy emotions were just icing on the cake. I mean, you just got through life and if you were happy too, that was a bonus. But now the research shows that happy emotions are not just the icing on the cake, they are the cake itself. Like Jesus said, he came to enable us to have life more abundantly. And that's really what the healthy positive emotions are about experiencing the abundant life that God wanted us to experience on this world. He wanted us to enjoy this world, to be filled with wonder, to, to be filled with thanksgiving, to support each other, to, to love each other and experience positive emotions here. But the world is broken and not everything is positive all the time. Ups and downs in life are inevitable particularly when like now, there are a lot of things that can pull us down because we can't do them. We are restricted. We are fearful and anxious. There are many things to worry about and we can get overwhelmed with the negative emotions and we see that many people are experiencing that. The reality is that we do need both positive and negative emotions. You cannot live in a broken world and just have positive emotions. That is not reality, okay? What we need to do is balance the negative ones with the positive ones so they don't make our boat sink. And the positive emotions can be like the wind in our sails that carry us across the waves that are going up and down. So a good balance of positive and negative emotions help us to flourish. And actually, the more positive emotions we can experience and choose to experience, the easier it is for us to deal with some of the negative emotions that drag us down because we can learn to balance them. <clears throat> I'm ever amazed by what Paul said in his letter to the Philippians, chapter four. If you have time, if we had time here this afternoon, we would do this together. But Philippians chapter four, is full of good wisdom for our mental health or mental well-being. And I would say, go there, study it. It's a short chapter, but it is packed with Paul's wisdom, things that are being discovered today that will protect your mental health and your well-being. When Paul wrote Philippians, he was actually on death's row in prison. There is hardly a worse place in the world to be than to be in prison and then also to be on death row. Paul is full of joy in Philippians. Why? Because he has learned to be content whatever the circumstances. He has the peace in his heart, this being still and knowing that I am God experience, no matter what is happening around him. So that is one of his secrets. He also talks about focusing on the positive, the beautiful, the lovely things. Think about the good things. Don't keep ruminating and worrying about the negative things. Shift your mind. When they start to go towards the negative things, he, he's sort of saying, pull it back and focus on the good, the positive. There is so much there that God has put in the world for us to think about. He also talks about gratitude, and that's an, a very important way to feel positive. Gratitude and anxiety can't really coexist in our brain. So the more gratitude we experience and express, the less anxious we will feel. And so that's an important principle to be thankful, to experience contentment, to focus on the positive, to praise God, to trust him for all things. Um, there is so much in that chapter. So do go and unpack it when you can. 
The positive emotions are important. They don't just make life nice, make life happy. They broaden our minds. They help us to learn. They help us recover from stress so that we don't get overloaded with it and burnt out. It helps to build resilience in us and our children and teenagers so they can face life's challenges. The more positive emotions we experience, the more we, we, are, um, we have the, the skills and the resilience to face the challenges. And they also help us to be a good witness in the world because when we are joyful Christians, people want what we have. Like, how can you be so joyful and peaceful at a time like this? Tell us your secret. So most people um, have a, a ratio of positive to negative emotions of two positive to one negative. Now, there is a way to work this out at positivityratio.com. It's a website um, and you can measure how much of each of the positive and negative emotions you would have had in your day and it will work out a ratio for you. And I thought, yeah, that's pretty good if we uh, experience positive emotions twice as much as negative ones. But actually, the research shows that the baseline for well-being is three times positive emotions to negative. So that's looking at how often and how intensely did you feel the positive emotions that I will discuss today and the negative emotions. So you rate them um, on their, their intensity to work out your ratio. Um, so what are some of the negative emotions that um, bother our lives? I'll talk about these a bit more, but they're anger, contempt, disgust, embarrassment, fear, frustration, guilt, sadness, shame, and stress. They're the 10 most common. Of course, there are more, um, and but these are the ones we are most likely to feel. Now, a lot of negative emotions are a normal, healthy response to living in a broken world, to having a sad or challenging situation. But if there are too many of them, they can drag us down into despair. We feel we can't they overwhelm us. They're like big heavy weights on our shoulders and we can feel helpless or too sad. And if you think about a time when you had a negative emotion recently, well, I've had an effect on your life, but don't focus on that because Paul said, think about the positive things. So, but you can recognize when you have a negative emotion, it has a, an effect on your peace in your life. So let's look at these negative emotions. So anger, Feeling displeasure, hostility, or antagonism towards someone or something. Now, psychologists also talk about anger being a secondary emotion, that we usually feel something first and then we get angry. We might feel frustrated and then get angry, or even sad and then get angry, or um, disappointed and then get angry. So it's very helpful to think about what was the emotion that got you angry? And then it's easier to deal with that emotion than anger. <clears throat> also, um, although this is listed as a negative emotion and frustration is listed separately, when I work as a therapist and people express anger, I will usually say to them, sounds like you're really frustrated, not it sounds like you're really angry. Because if I name someone's emotion as anger, it often makes them more angry. If I name it as frustration, then it's kind of it invites someone to come and support them in that feeling to you know, help relieve the frustration. And it's easier to say, yeah, I'm feeling really frustrated. So that's another tip for working with people who might be angry is to think about them as being frustrated, name it as frustration, or help them try and find the feeling that got them to the anger point. Mm -hmm. But anger can also be positive. You know, in the Bible, Jesus got angry in the temple because there was injustice. There was there's something that was destroying the worship of the, the temple. And he was so frustrated with that because people couldn't see God in that place for all the, the money changes and the, and the marketplace. And so the anger um, inspired him to do something positive, to make a positive change. And so anger can also inspire us to make a positive change in our own life, in the life of someone else. So it can be a driving force for something good if we let it be that. Contempt is one of the most negative feelings we can feel as human beings. It's really toxic inside when we show contempt to others, when we feel that we are superior and we look down on someone else. 
that is such a, a negative feeling for us to, to have in our bodies. Then there is disgust, feeling of being revolted by something or someone that sounds, feels, looks, tastes, or smells horrible. It's just revolting. Mm -hmm. Then there's embarrassment, that feeling of shame when something you did wrongly or badly is made public. And you go like, oh no, everyone just saw that on Facebook or everyone just you know, experienced that. And many young people are experiencing this because of social media. It's very destructive to them because now there is more capacity for more people to, to know what you did wrong and you feel so exposed. So we need to be aware of that. Fear is a feeling of anxiety uh, about a situation you don't feel you're going to be able to handle well. So it might be um, um, something that, that scares you. And sometimes it's a funny thing. Like I can sometimes be scared of getting on an escalator. And it's a long story and it goes back to an experience in childhood. And sometimes I'm not afraid when I go to the escalator. And sometimes I am afraid. Um, and my husband knows how to help me. When I feel afraid, and he has sometimes walked two kilometers with me, so we didn't have to go on the escalator down to the underground. Um, so it's a real possible or probable situation that I feel unable to handle well. I feel I'm going to fall down the escalator, and that's scary to me. So it's a bit weird, I know, but um, there's a long story behind that. So frustration is feeling irritated when it takes longer to reach your goals than you expected or when someone is critical of you and you're trying to do your best, the best you can do, and someone comes along and instead of encouraging you, they say, oh, you missed a bit there, or you, you, know, you should have done that, and you just feel ah, so frustrated. Guilt is when we think we've done something wrong or hurt someone and we feel really sad and bad about that. So we have done something that makes us feel bad. Sadness comes when we've lost something and we feel helpless, alone, or misunderstood or disadvantaged. It's to do with all sorts of losses, really. And today, many people are experiencing many losses due to COVID-19. And so there's a greater weight of sadness on them and they feel more alone. And loneliness is actually um, as bad for our health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So we need to be aware if someone is feeling alone it's, it's really bad for their health and how can we help them? Then there's shame, feeling inadequate or guilty, though I often feel that shame is what someone else has put on us, not from what we have done. Other people may shame us um, for all sorts of reasons. So it's their attitude towards us that shames us rather than something that we have done wrong. Stress is feeling that you're being asked to do more than you can manage. And if you don't make it, if you don't work hard enough, someone will see you as a failure. And, and that's kind of what stress is about. <clears throat> Fortunately, there are some really healthy, happy emotions. And these help us to flourish. So these are the nice ones to focus on. We'll forget the negative ones now. <clears throat> these are the 10 most common positive emotions. Amusement and fun thankfulness, inspiration, joy, serenity, love, awe and wonder, hope, interest, and I'll explain that later, and feeling valued and valuable, or that I've done something well that other people appreciate. <clears throat> so, amusement and laughter. So we know that a merry heart does good like a medicine. When we laugh and smile at something unexpected, unusual, and safe, it's really good for us. Laughter is so brilliant. It helps children to learn. It helps us to relieve stress. It can actually help you to diffuse a conflict. Just looking at the funny side of what happened there. So how ridiculous Bernie and I were to even make a big deal about potatoes. I mean, that's ridiculous. And later we would laugh about it. <clears throat> so laughing, humor is best when we laugh together, laugh with people and not at people. So um, if we're laughing at people, that's contempt and that's a negative emotion. It's when we laugh together about watching funny animals, seeing something funny on YouTube, um, having a good healthy joke together, uh, seeing the funny side of things, that's really positive for us to, to laugh together. Then there is awe and wonder, and I love this. It's a sense of wonder about something beautiful in nature that God has made or in another person. 
and it is just incredible. And so David had this sense of awe and wonder in many of his Psalms. When he looks up at the sky, when he looks at creation, he's just filled with awe and wonder. The other night, Bernie and I went out for a walk and we could see that there weren't just stars in the sky, there were, there were planets and we were trying to work out what they were because we could see one looked a bit red and we were trying to work out online which one it would be. But just filling with wonder when you look at the night sky or, or any sky. Right now, out of my window, I can see the sun setting and that's beautiful. If there is nothing else that I can wonder about, I look at my hand. I think my hand is amazing. I think my eye is amazing, but I can't see my eye. So it's easier to look at my hand and look at how it works, all the things it can do, it can feel, it can make creative things, it can work my keyboard. My hands are amazing. If you took them away from me, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. So I can just wonder about these incredible hands God has given me. So whenever we choose to focus on awe and wonder and nature, it is so good for our heart. It brings joy and peace and healing to us. And we can choose to do that at any moment. Stop and look around us with our children, with whoever we're with, at something that fills us with wonder and focus on it. Don't just skip past it, like spend time looking at that flower, watching that creature, listening to the bird's song, and being filled with awe. Gratitude, uh, I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> is a really positive experience for us because whenever we thank someone else, it makes us happy too. And so it's really positive. There is one Christian psychologist who said, before you get out of bed in the morning, list 30 things you are thankful for. Well, some of us might be late for work if we did that, but it's a good principle. Think of 30 things you're thankful for. With our children, we used to go through the alphabet. We would be driving to a church somewhere on Sabbath and we'd go through the alphabet, thanking God for things beginning with A. And then when we ran out, we'd go to B and C and so on. And when we did that, our hearts were just full of so much gratitude. Sometimes I walked down the street and I just constantly thank God for something I am seeing or hearing or experiencing. And when I finish thanking him for one thing, I find another and go into the next sentence in my head, thanking God for a constant stream of things I am thankful for. Or just stand in your room right now if you're locked down and thank God for at least 10 things in every room in your house that God has provided for you. And just let your hearts be filled with gratitude. Hope is important, and I guess right now some hopes are dashed as we go into another lockdown, but it's the hope and belief that things can and will change. They will find a vaccine. The lockdown won't last forever. Hopefully we'll be out of this by Christmas. So we have all sorts of things we can hope for. And as a, as a household, we have a, an adult, a young adult living with us at the moment. We came together a few days ago and said, Let's do something every evening together at nine o'clock that we can just enjoy doing together. So every day we have something to look forward to. We can put our work down. We can play a game. We can do something fun together, do some cooking or make a hot chocolate. And that gives us a little bit of hope for every day. We must always have something we're looking forward to. And yes, we have the blessed hope. But we need little hopes along the way that encourage our heart that we have to look forward to. And I love how God gave his people feast after feast after feast throughout their year. So there was always something to look forward to in their calendar. And I think we've lost some of that in, in, our, in our culture today and in, in our church today. This need, desire to have something to look forward to that helps us get through the rough times now because you know what, next week, next month, we'll be doing this and that will be so good. Inspiration is recognizing excellence in another person or being inspired by, by God, scripture, um, someone's sermon, a devotion, anything where we go, wow, that's, that's a, a new amazing idea, that's something excellent, um, I want to learn, I want to grow. 
So whenever we have that sense of being inspired by something, that's another positive emotion. Interest, um, I didn't choose this photograph, someone chose it for me. I wouldn't choose a photograph of people on the railway line trying to take photographs, they need to find a different one. But interest is having a hobby that absorbs us, that we can lose ourselves in. So the disciples like to fish, for Jesus, he was a carpenter. I guess he would get absorbed in his carpentry at time. We all need a hobby to absorb us, to distract us from everyday things when we start to worry, when we can just lose ourselves in a book, in a piece of art, in running and exercise, whatever it is that we do to um, experience something positive. It's the desire to explore, to discover, to learn, to focus on something that will um, keep our minds focused on positive things and enjoyment rather than the worries in our life. And we all need a good hobby. Um, and we know more and more about how good these hobbies are for us, for our well being. Gardening is a natural one God gave us, but also um, crafts, knitting, uh, repetitive things can be very soothing. Um, sports can be very healthy. So we need these interests, these positive interests. Joy is a feeling of happy delight, playfulness and freedom. It's different to laughter. It's not funny, but there's just that lovely sense of, wow, joy. Um, I like to go for a walk every day and look for something that brings me joy on that walk. And I really enjoy going on my walk. I walk the same way every day, just about but I love being outside, looking for nature, watching the seasons change and experiencing that joy is so important. Healthy pride. Now there's different ways to describe this. It's feeling that what you do is valued by others, that you do something that other people recognize that you do well or that they appreciate um, about you, that you do, do something as well as you can and others appreciate it. We all need to know that we're doing something well. It's not bad to know, have someone say to us, I really enjoyed that, that was, that inspired me. You do, do that such a good job there. With children, the thing to reinforce is not the, um, the end result, it's the process. Encourage them for their effort, not their achievement. So we encourage their effort. So if they're playing the violin, we don't necessarily say, wow, you're the best violinist in the world. We say, wow, you're really doing well at practicing that violin. It's coming on better all the time. You're really putting a lot of effort into that. So you appreciate the effort they're putting in and that encourages them more than saying, well, you're the best violinist because then they don't have to try anymore. So by, by encouraging their effort, that's the important thing. And that doesn't give them a pride, a feeling of I've achieved it now, but my determination is to practice harder, and that's the good thing. <clears throat> Serenity is feeling peaceful, still, calm, and contented. Um, you know, I go and work in 22 different countries. I'm in places sometimes, language is not mine. I don't know what's going on. They, um, the presentation isn't working out. There's something chaotic happening, or I'm just feeling a bit nervous. And I will just pause and say, Take a deep breath and say, be still and know that I am God. And I just do that calmly a couple of times and it gives me so much peace. Another thing that you can do is to pretend you're blowing really big bubbles, a deep breath. And then blowing out really slowly. <clears throat> and that's a natural way that your body calms itself down. That kind of deep breathing, slow exhale is a natural calming for your body. I discovered this when I would be a very stressed out mum sometimes. And one day I went out in the garden and I just started blowing the children's bubbles and I realized how much the breathing calmed me down. So you can just pretend to blow bubbles or you can find something like be still and know that I am God that will calm you. You can pray, you can light candles, you can do all sorts of things that Whatever it is that gives you a sense of peace in this unpeaceful world right now. There are so many things that we can do naturally to help us experience that. 
and love is a blend of all these wonderful positive emotions in a warm, close, safe and caring relationship. So we laugh together, we experience peace together, we have joy together, we share wonder together. And it's so much better when we're not alone because God said at the beginning, it is not good for man to be alone. And so when we share these feelings with each other, they are, um, we can enjoy them so much more. So emotions are parts, they're ways our bodies communicate with us and tell us what is happening around us so that we know what to do, to run away, to stay there, to enjoy it, to laugh. They're really important for us. God showed emotions, we can see them in the Bible. Jesus showed emotions. They are really important. They are also invitations to connect. And that's how this love comes in. So when I'm happy, I want to share that joy with someone else. When I feel peaceful, I want to share it with someone else. And when I feel sad, I want someone to come and comfort me. And so Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn is an important principle. Experience your feelings, positive and negative, with others. And they will always feel much better when they are in, in relationship and we are connected with those who support us in our frustration, in our sadness, or encourage us when we're feeling down. It's a matter of perspective. So if you look at this picture, it looks dark and gloomy. It's not a very beautiful picture. And we can focus on that in our life. We can focus on the things that are dark and gloomy in this world because there's plenty of them, but actually it's part of this bigger picture. And sometimes we can be so focused on the dark part in that big tree that we forget that the sky is beautiful. There are flowers in the field. There's a mother and her son walking in the sunshine in a relaxed way. There's a, a home at the center at the back, a safe place. We need to take a step back and look at, as Paul did, um, the wonderful things around him and not just his prison cell and the death sentence. He was able to be content, to be peaceful, to be joyful, to be grateful in that place because of his perspective, because he could see that the world and his life was so much more than that room. And his relationship with God was full of these wonderful things that could keep him joyful in a hard time. So I wonder what you do to create healthy and positive emotional balance in your life. There are many things, the inspiration of Bible study, enjoyable exercise, thinking positive thoughts like Paul did, watching a funny movie, thinking about what went well today, being with your loved ones, talking to a friend. These are all things that we can do even in lockdown that help us to stay emotionally healthy in a challenging world. On the NHS website, these are listed as five ways to emotional well-being. Connect with others spiritually, emotionally, and socially. Be active. Pay attention to the details of nature, life, beauty, and relationships. Give generously, because actually those who give generously are happier than those who keep everything to themselves and keep learning and growing. And what I love is that all of these are deeply embedded in our, our beliefs as Adventists, in the way that we express our faith. We connect with others spiritually, emotionally, and socially. We encourage active um, exercise. We en encourage people to look at God's creation and look at healthy relationships and pay attention to beauty. We encourage giving generously. We encourage keeping on learning and growing through Sabbath school lessons, discipleship, our focus on education. These are all things which are inherent in our, in, our, uh, in our faith. And the NHS says, these are good for you. God knew they were good for us. And he's given us them in the Bible. And now the NHS is just reminding us that these things are, are really important for us too. So how do we help um, children and others around us and ourselves? So it says children and each one, but um, it works for anybody really. How do we help people to manage their negative emotions? Well, we need to let children see how we manage our negative emotions well, how we talk about them and how we deal with them. Quite often, we don't have these conversations with our children. <clears throat> it could go like this. 
So at the dinner table, I could say, you know, today I had this really frustrating experience when I wanted to photocopy something that was really important. And when I went to the photocopier, it didn't work. And I was so frustrated because I had a deadline and I couldn't do this task. And then I thought, I wonder what else I can do. I wonder who can help me. And then I remembered my friend has a small photocopier in her office. I went to her. She let me photocopy the material. And I felt so much better. It reduced my stress. Now, you might not normally tell your child a story like that, but it's important because it's you name frustration. You describe what it is. It's a goal you couldn't reach. You know, something was stopping you reach your goal. You talk about how you felt. You talk about how you thought about the problem, how you solved it, and then how you felt better later. And that's really important for children to understand. They need to name the negative emotions and understand how we deal with it when we do feel sad or angry or frustrated or stressed or whatever. So the more words we give children for their emotions, positive and negative, the more they can talk about them and the less they act them out by in their behavior. Because most of children's behavior that we see as negative is fueled by negative emotions in the inside of them. We need to be aware of that. Rather than punish children when they're, when they're behaving badly, find out what going on because usually there are some negative mm -hmm. feelings inside they can't describe they haven't got words for um, and they need comfort rather than yet more pain and being told off so help children to find words for their emotions so they can talk about them with you um, this this is again that same thing help children to name their negative feelings and it's important for all of us so Bernie's mother is German and when he was born, he was the first child. She had just come to England. She um, didn't speak much English. So she didn't want to speak German to him because she was afraid in those days he would be bullied for being German. So he didn't have many words to begin with because she didn't have many words. And when I married him, he knew, and I said, how are you feeling? He had like mad, bad, glad, and sad. And that was about it. And um, and I had been brought up with lots of different words for feeling. So I was like a bit frustrated about that. But over time, um, he's learned some more words for his feelings and we've learned together and, um, and helped each other to understand more about how we each feel. We need to show that we're listening to other people's feelings, whether they're children, teenagers, friends, strangers, listen to their feelings. Even if they can't tell you what they are, um, see what's happening and kind of say, it sounds like, you know, you're really frustrated. It sounds like you're stressed. It sounds like really sad. Um, and when we feed that back to them and show we understand, that can be really helpful. And it's okay if we don't get it right. They'll say, well, no, I'm not really sad. It's more this. And we can help them to find what they're feeling a bit better. So help children and people to feel understood. Once we show we understand the feelings, we shouldn't just jump in there and make things right for them. We need to support them to find their own solutions. So we could say, well, let's go on the internet and you, you go and put in some search words and let's see what you can find on there that might help you with your problem. So that they have some skills for finding how to sort out their own issues as they grow up. And they're not dependent on us to make things right for them all the time. When children manage their difficult feelings well, so they could have got really cross or sad or, and they didn't, they managed to control it and it's really hard for them. Tell them you're doing a really good thing there. I know it's really hard because you're feeling really angry or frustrated right now with your little brother, but you're doing really well to stay calm and not, not hit him for spoiling your, your Lego um, building. So we need to help people manage their strong feelings, but set limits on children when they, so they know when they're behaving inappropriately. So yeah, I know you're feeling really frustrated right now, but you can't smash things. You must keep things safe and I need to keep you safe too. So you need to just sit here until you can calm down a bit and I'll stay with you. And then when you're calmer, we can start again. 
Now, this is where hobbies are important, helping children to manage or anyone to manage negative emotions by having a hobby they can turn to, something to distract themselves, a book, a, a hobby, anything that they can do that way, where they can just forget about their troubles for a while and stop the ruminating circular pattern in their head. Um, so help children find something, even make a pile of interesting things to do when you're feeling frustrated or bothered, you can go to this basket and pull out some interesting toys, puzzles, books, uh, soothing music, whatever it is to help them calm down and know how to distract yourself when something's bothering you too. Never dismiss people's feelings or shame them for having negative feelings because if you add shame to what they're feeling, they're gonna feel worse. It's not gonna help anything. Feelings just happen and there is no shame in the feelings. Um, so don't tell them, oh, you shouldn't be sad like that. Big boys don't cry. That is actually, we're finding now that's a really dangerous message. I know when I was a child, I heard that a lot to boys around me, big boys don't cry. Um, but now we're finding when we don't comfort boys when they are sad, we actually, um, they, they learn not to comfort others when other people are sad. They lose the ability to empathize and they actually can become um, more likely to be violent. And so we need to be aware that by, by um, being negative about children's feelings and shaming them for crying, we can be blocking an important part of their sadness, being comforted, learning how to comfort others process in their brain. We're only just discovering this, thing, so we just have to do our best with what we did in the past and uh, make some changes now. So we need to help children manage their negative emotions and say, do you remember that time? I know it's really hard. I know you feel really sad right now and you just want to um, behave in this way. But remember last time this happened and you were able to manage really well. So if they have managed their feelings well in the past, Remind them of that. So what did you do then? You know, when you were, were able to handle yourself in, um, a couple of weeks ago, what helped you and how can we do more of that? Also, don't lie to a child to about a situation to avoid a negative emotion. So I remember when I used to um, have injections as a child, the nurse would say, this won't hurt. And then they, you know, really hurt you. And so you learn not to trust nurses. And when we lie to children to avoid a negative emotion, then they stop trusting that what we say about feelings is, um, is true. And so we need to be careful not to do that to them, not to lie to them. But there are good things we can do. We can be a good role model and fill our lives with, um, intentionally fill our lives with joyfulness and gratitude. Um, and this can be really helpful because life has the negative emotions. So what happens to me sometimes I'm, when I was working in the office, I would get the bus home after a long, tiring day. And I would sit on the bus and I think, oh dear, that was a day. Um, and then I would choose to experience one of the positive emotions rather than thinking about all the things that were difficult and stressful. I will focus on nature, looking out the window. I will say things I'm grateful to God for. I will pray for people that I want to pray for. I will think about things that did go well. And this is what helped me to stay balanced because I learned that I can choose to um, experience the happy and positive emotions. Before I learned this, I was much more of a, a melancholy person, a, a cup half empty, a pessimist. Um, and once I learned that even when times are tough, I can be intentional about focusing on gratitude or wonder or distracting myself or something else. And then that really changed my experience completely about my emotions because I realized I can choose what I focus on. I can't choose the feelings that I start with that come to me, but once I'm in that situation, I can say, okay, I'm feeling this but I'm going to choose to do this to help rebalance me so that I don't get overwhelmed with negative emotions. So I have the choice to experience more intentionally the happy emotions in my life. And we all have that possibility. <clears throat> so 
help children find what interests them, find their hobbies, explore their world, so they can find a, a job, a, a career in something that they love, whether it's music or nature or sport, help them to find the things that bring them joy. Teach children to be kind, or any of us can be kind, because when we're kind to others and loving, then we feel good and they feel good too. So helping children to be kind to other people helps them to experience really positive, happy and healthy emotions. Um, get children to laugh or anyone to laugh before you teach them something new, because it makes it easier for them to learn when they're laughing. It opens our minds to learn new things, to be more creative, to solve our problems. Um, and so laughter is really helpful for learning. Um, it's good to encourage all of us to look for what we did well each day, what we can be proud of, what made them happy. And at the end of the day, whether you're a child or an adult, think of three things that you did well. I know that it's so easy to crawl into bed at the end of the day, think of all the things you did wrong, feel bad and guilty and discouraged and go to bed feeling worried and anxious. But actually at the end of the day, stop, let go, choose to think of three things that you did well. As Paul says, in Philippians 4, 8, whatever things are lovely, beautiful, of good report, think about those things and think about three things you did well. You actually probably did 97 things well, but you will just, re you'll just remember that the three things you did wrong and there is so much you're doing well every single day, um, but we tend to focus on what the mistakes we made and they are just opportunities for learning. So at the end of the day, list three things you did well. Think about them and help children to think about them. Teenagers sit on the end of their bed and go, you know what, today I noticed you do this, this and this. And that made me so proud of you. I was so happy. Um, so they may have done naughty things that annoyed you, but tell them the three things they did well and you will warm their heart too and build the relationship with them. So take photographs of your happy experiences, um, go back and revisit them. Help children find a place, or all of us, a place to be quiet and peaceful because our lives can be so busy and rushed. And we need to pause, to be quiet, to be quiet with God, to pray, to think happy and healthy thoughts and to just have that special time together. Maybe as part of your family worship time or a walk in the country, just sit down on the grass. If it's dry, it's not going to be nice to sit on the grass for a few months yet, but find a quiet and peaceful place somewhere where they can just think and pray and experience joy. Help children to be thankful as often as you can, as well as you too. And there was a lovely video um, called A Good Day with brother David Steindl Rast. And he helps all of us to be grateful for the simple, small things that are in our life every day. He has a whole website called uh, gratefulness.org, full of gratitude. So inspire children and, and, and yourself by going to see things where you see excellence. Um, read documentaries and films about inspiring people. Many of the people in the Bible are examples of great excellence that you can study. Um, people today who are doing amazing things, um, learn about them because that helps us to strive ourselves, encourages us to do the best we can for God as well. So find ways to fill your life and your family's lives, even in this lockdown time, with as many positive emotions as possible. So remember the list of those 10 things. If you need to, I can share some handouts with you. I can share them with your pastor. Um, and then look for ways that you can put those positive emotions into your life every day. So find a time you can laugh together with your family or with someone else online if you're on your own. Look at something you, that can fill you with wonder. Take a photograph of it. Share it on Instagram. Whatever it is that you are doing, find a way to fill your life with positive emotions and share them with other people so that we can flourish together the way that God intended us to flourish. So I wonder what you've learned from this experience, this workshop. When I first learned these things, I was so um, 
excited because as I say, it really changed my whole attitude to my life. Um, I have quite a stressful job, but it helps me to stay balanced and positive and joyful and grateful by being aware of these things. So that when I feel I'm tipping more into the negative emotions, I will intentionally choose more of the positive experiences to bring me back. And where possible, I share them with other people around me so they can experience them too. Now I'm gonna show you a video and I hope this works as a nice ending to the day. Let's see. Oh, no, let's go back one. Let's see if it will come. Um, this is supposed to work. If not, I'll try another way to make it work. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can get it up in a different place. Um, because this video is, they're lovely videos from Igniter Media, which are Christian ones and uh, they're very positive. So this one is all about joy. So I'm hoping this will play. Um, can you see this yet? No, I need to share screen. So share screen and here we go. Well, thank you for having me. I hope that that um, gave you some useful ideas. I know it's really helped me um, in my life. And so I hope that it will help you too and to experience the abundant life that Jesus wants us to experience. So thank you for having me today. Um, I'm not quite sure what is supposed to happen just now, but uh, I'm sure it will be revealed soon. Um, well, in the meantime, while we're waiting, I will say a, a prayer and, um, and then we can see what happens next. Father God, I want to thank you that you have made us wonderfully. Thank you that you've given us ways to help us manage our conflicts peacefully so that we can be your children in this world and bring healing to relationships. Thank you that you want us to experience the abundant life and that you have given us so many ways to experience joy and wonder and love and laughter and positive things in this world and help us not to forget that they are available to us when we need them. Help us to share these positive emotions with those around us, to encourage them through these challenging times, to keep our spirits up, to help us to be resilient, to develop resilient children and to and find joy 
even in lockdown, help us to find the moments of joy and love and wonder and sharing that can bring us closer to you in this incredible opportunity of changing our lives so that we have to think differently about how we do things. So I thank you for the Sabbath that has been today. We pray that every family and person who attended today will be blessed by this Sabbath and encouraged and nurtured and strengthened for the week ahead. We thank you for the beauty of the sunset this evening and we ask that you go with us step by step in the coming week to guide us closer towards you and to each other. We thank you for your love. May we learn more about it every day so it can transform us and our relationships through Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Carol. It's, it's been a, a long day, but I believe this was a, a well-spent Sabbath. And what we've learned today, I myself has been, have been very blessed. And we all know that many times you are in that situation where you are to choose which emotions will take over. And the Holy Spirit is always there to help us but we need to have a choice. Mm -hmm. And thanks for, for presenting to us, Karen, these wonderful messages. And this is sunset time, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So I'm just wondering uh, if we maybe can sing a song together. Do you have anything in store? Uh, Natalie and Tuck. And after that, we have some songs, some special numbers from the, our friends and from our district as well. Well, while we, we wait, I just would like to give you an announcement, is especially for Huntingdon Church, okay? So, Brother Sharing asked me to, to give a quick announcement. Huntingdon Church is going to have the week of prayer readings, okay? So, I'll just let you know here the dates and the time. You're going to have, have your readings together of the week of prayer is Sunday, seven o'clock, all right? Wednesday as well, and Friday as well. So Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday, 7 p.m. I will be with you on Wednesday, okay? Dear Huntington brethren and friends, I'll be with you on Wednesday, seven o'clock for the, the reading of the week of prayer. And we are as well in Riverlane Church, our week of prayer readings. You can all join through the, you can see the information in your WhatsApp forum for Riverlane Church. Central Church as well, they are organizing and we had an announcement in the morning. And we hope you will be very blessed. I haven't heard from Portuguese Church, but they will probably come up with a plan and share in the WhatsApp forum. Uh, I always remember when I see sunset time that God never forgets us. And one day, dear brethren, the sun will rise and we will never have darkness again. Yeah. This is a wonderful thought. So I would like to invite you... Uh, to think now in what blessings are you going to focus in the new week? Is that I'm putting in practice already, Karen, what we've learned. <laughs> so are you going maybe to have a bit more time for yourself or in the new week, maybe you're looking forward to have some ice cream with your kids? Try to find a healthier option. But it's always good to have ice cream. 
what are the, the blessings God is giving to you? Probably you have challenges, but everybody that has challenges has blessings as well. Otherwise, they wouldn't be alive. So it's very important for us to focus on that. And uh, Natalie, in TAC, do you have anything prepared? So we, we found the hymn 51, number 51, Day is Dying in the West. Um, and then do you want us to play the special music from the girls from the Portuguese church? Yeah, and we have as well the vines. So maybe we will, because we will, unfortunately, we don't have much time. So maybe we will watch the two videos then. Is that all right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. The only problem is, Pastor, we only have the one video. We just have the girls from the Portuguese. Oh, that's fine. Yes, no problem. Okay. We can listen to them. Okay. We can finish. So we will all learn Portuguese today. I will try to translate to you, okay? Yes, okay. yes please. Uh, is made of 
Texas. sharing this praise and here we finish our program today our sabbath i would like to say a final prayer for you and i also would like to thank all that were involved in this program all that have been watching it and taking part may the lord bless you richly and I'm looking forward for our next fellowship day in 2020. Okay? Maybe it's going to be a very different fellowship day. I don't know. But God has something in store for us. I'm sure about that. Let us pray. Dear Lord, and thank you for the wonderful expectancy of the second Jesus coming. That can surpass all the negativity and all the sense of sadness and, and loss we have in this world, dear Lord. This wonderful day when all your children will rejoice. They will be like gazelles jumping and rejoicing. I, I can't imagine, dear Lord, how it's going to be that day when we look at each other and say, we made it through. We will look at Jesus. What a day it will be, dear Lord. And to get there, we just need to live one day after the other. So we pray, dear Lord. We thank you for today, for the blessings of this Sabbath. And we pray for tomorrow that your promise will be made in our life a reality. That you will be with us every day until the last day, dear Lord when we will be with you forever. We pray for Karen, for her ministry, for her life, for Bernie as well, her husband, and for her children, grandchildren. Please, dear Lord, may you reward her and bless her efforts to, to change, dear Lord, the reality around her. Pray for our church as well in our district that we will learn and put in practice, dear Lord, under the guidance of your Holy Spirit, what we've learned today. We pray as well for those experiencing challenges in their lives, and we will keep on praying, dear Lord, for them, and we hope that you will listen to these prayers in, an, in a way much more wonderful than what we think. Please, dear Lord, stay with us in this new week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So that's it 